Hi everyone, welcome to the 48th session of the Med AI Group Exchange Sessions. Um, this week we have Dylan Slack um, from the University of California, California Irvine here with us to present his work on exposing shortcomings and improving the reliability of ML uh, systems. So, uh, sorry, ML explanations. Dylan is a PhD candidate at UC Irvine and is um, co-advised by Samir Singh and Himal Akaraju. And he's associated with the UCI NLP, CREATE, and the HPI um, Research Center. His research focuses on developing techniques to help practitioners build more robust, reliable, and trustworthy ML models. And he's also held um, research internships at Google AI and Amazon AWS, and um, has done more fairness um, research work in ML. So thanks so much, Dylan, for joining us today. And um, before we start, do you have any preferences on how you'd like to take questions? Um, uh, is it okay if you interrupt you, or would you like them at the end? Yeah. Um... I guess we have a you know reasonably sized group here, so feel free to interrupt me, and we can chat about things as they arise. Um, I think my plan is to sort of pause about halfway throughish, and you know take just a quick break and ask for some questions, so we can do that um, as okay. well, and also at the end. Okay, perfect. Um, so as always, let's try to make this session as interactive as possible, and uh, without further ado, let me hand it over to Dilip. Sweet. Um, well, thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm excited to talk about uh, a few of our works over the past couple of years, um, sort of in the context of looking at postdoc explanations for machine learning, looking at where these methods fall short and kind of what we're doing to improve the reliability. Um, so there's a couple of things I want to hit on today. Uh, I kind of want to provide, or I want to provide a brief overview of machine learning explanations um, so what are postdoc explanations? What are these techniques really doing? Um, why you might want to care about them? Um, so I'm going to provide a, a fair amount of context here. Um, I'm going to look at a few of our works where we, we sort of ask the question, like, where can these methods fall short? Um, what, are the, what are the sort of fundamental issues with these techniques? Um, what are they doing that isn't working? Um, and then I'm going to sort of end more a, a bit on a, a positive note. Um, asking the question, how can we do better? And in particular, looking at some, some works where we fix or try to fix uh, a, few of a few of the issues with these techniques. Um, this work wouldn't be possible without uh, several collaborators, as well as uh, fellowship support from um, various places. So I wanted to start um, from a relatively simple place. Um, so let's just say, uh, we're trying to build uh, a classifier. And we have an idea that we want to build some awesome model to tell apart uh, birds and dogs. Uh, so we have um, birds and dogs, and we just want to have a model that says, this is a bird or this is a dog. So when we see something like this, we're going to use a deep neural network, and we want it to say bird. When we see something like this dog on the couch, we're going to use a deep neural network, and we want it to say dog. So how would we do this? Um, a good first step is I would go I would go around my house, um, snap photos of my dog on the couch, on the bean bag, um, and then go outside and take some photos of birds. And with my labeled data, I'd shuffle it up. I'd do something like gradient descent and uh, train up my neural network. Um, and after this is all done, I could inspect some model predictions just to see how well um, my, method is, my method is doing, my model is doing. Um, so maybe I start to look through some of these things and I see photos of a dog. It looks like it's saying dog, that's great. I see a photo of a bird, says bird, all good. Photo of a dog, um, says dog. So things seem pretty promising so far. Um, it seems like it's starting to work. Um, one thing to note here is that uh, because I've used something like a deep neural network, um, I've, I've ultimately built a black box classifier. It's kind of hard for me to um, figure out if this model is making uh, decisions for the right reasons. I sort of don't really know what mechanisms um, the model is using um, and sort of what parts of the input space the model is looking at um, to understand predictions. So it's kind of hard for me to, to really know what it's going on, even though I sort of see some positive signal from the classifications it's outputting. In particular, this makes it quite tricky to know what, what aspects of the model um, to fix if, some, if something does go wrong. And in fact, 
when I bring this model into the real world, um, I start to see um, some issues. So I go on a walk, I snap a photo of my dog outside, and all of a sudden my, my, my model is spitting out um, bird. Um, so it's sort of starting to fail um, in the wild. So, so why is this going on? So post-talk explanations are, are one tool that can help us figure out um, where things bad or what's going on uh, with my model that's leading it not to, not to work out. And really what these techniques do is they show important parts of the input space, um, in this case, an image that are sort of critical for um, any given prediction. So um, if I went ahead and ran post-talk explanations, um, here, this is Lime, one post-talk explanation technique, on those images of the dogs, um, I'd get something that looks like this. So um, this is the, the original image on the left-hand side here, and this is the postdoc explanation. And these areas um, that are highlighted, like the areas that aren't blacked out, the areas that are highlighted in the image are the parts of the input that are sort of most influential um, for the prediction. And if we look at this, we see something a little bit surprising. Um, so we see that like parts of the couch are highlighted as important and not so much of the dog. And in fact, if I do this for more images and I look at the, the photos of the dog, I see that um, consistently parts of the couch is being highlighted um, as being important for the prediction. And sort of, uh-oh, I've realized I've built um, a couch detector. I'm not a dog detector. And if I sort of think, go back and think through how I generated this data, um, you'll remember that I only took photos of my dog sitting on the couch um, and only photos of birds outside. So there kind of wasn't really enough signal for my model to figure out like the actual difference between dogs and birds. And we could sort of rely on the spurious to signal of couch or not. Um, and it seems like the model is relying on that. And I sort of realized that by using postdoc explanation techniques. So we can, we, can, we can see that this is one potential application for these methods and one way that they could help us. And even though that example is a bit contrived, um, these sorts of spurious correlations, these sorts of issues um, really do uh, emerge in the real world. So there's this relatively well-known example um, where a company built an AI interview system uh, where ultimately it was relying on the background. So if the background changed to like a photo of a bookcase versus just a, a, a blank wall, um, people would appear more open, conscientious, agreeable, um, and things like that. So this sort of indicates that the model is relying on some, some poor signals in the data. Um, and you could use a technique to like post-doc explanations to, to help figure this out. So with that motivation in mind, um, let's take a look at what these methods actually are. So wh what are they and um, why should you care about them? As I've said, these, these techniques look at uh, the most important parts of the input X for the model predictions y, uh, y for a given model F. And we're interested in doing this in a model agnostic way. And what I mean by that is X could like uh, be any type of data and F could be any sort of classifier. So X could be an image and we could be interested in what, which parts of the image are most important for the outcome. It could be some natural language text and we could be interested in which words or phrases or combinations of phrases um, most influence a prediction or it could be some uh, structured data. Um, uh, for something like loan prediction. And we're interested in questions like, is income more important than age uh, for determining whether to give someone a loan? And with this class of model agnostic local explanations um, that we're interested in, they sort of rely on this one, um, this one main, main assumption. Um, and I'll tell you what this is. So if we think back to our dog and bird classifier, you can imagine that uh, globally, the classifier would be, could be quite complex. So it could have some super wonky decision surface that looks like this, um, and uh, data points that appear in this purplish area are birds, and data points that appear in this whitish area are dogs. And it's quite hard to say like what the model is doing um, at a global scale because of this complexity. And what these techniques do is they say, instead of, instead of giving an explanation for the model globally, I'm just gonna fix a given prediction here, this black data point. I'm gonna zoom in on this area. And all of a sudden, uh, my model looks much more locally linear. 
And because of that, I could fit um, an easier to understand model, more interpretable model um, in this local vicinity of this prediction and offer it to users as my explanation. Um, and this model would be, think, would be locally accurate. Um, it would better explain this uh, local area because it's more linear. Um, and it could also be a bit more interpretable, as I've said. And I want to emphasize that uh, uh, th this term model agnostic. Um, so uh, when we're building like model agnostic explanations, we're interested in doing this for any class of hire um, and any, any data. And, and kind of uh, to provide some intuition for why we can do that, um, let's see like uh, the signal we would need to fit one of these local explanations. So if we had like a given prediction, it's this uh, greenish dot now, um, if I had a prediction, all I would need to fit one of these local models is a way to sample points nearby this prediction. And then I would need the, the models, um, like a, or the class probability associated with uh, the prediction class we're interested in. And we can sort of see that uh, with these perturbations, referred to as perturbations, and the, the class probabilities, I have enough signal to fit something like um, a locally weighted regression to offer as my explanation. Um, so that's kind of why we're able to do this for, for any model, for any data set in classifier. So because you, you, you just need this like, um, you know, very basic signal to, to fit a model and not to an explanation. Um, so let's briefly look at uh, one certain type of these explanations, which is known as Lime. Um, this is um, from a while back now, um, but it's one of the, the better known types of local explanation techniques. Um, so what Lime does is it takes an original image and computes the class probability um, this, on this original input. And in, ImageNet is Lime Spaniel with class probability 0.8. Um, Lime computes uh, a set of perturbations um, that look like this. And these perturbations are the original image, which just with areas of the image like blacked out, basically. And then with these perturbations, it takes the classifier and computes um, the Blenheim, Splat, Blenheim Spaniel class probability. We can kind of see that when we remove certain parts of the image, um, the class probability drops more. And ultimately, Lime uses this as a signal to figure out which parts of the image are more important for the prediction. So what Lime does is it fits a weighted regression on these perturbations um, in class probabilities. And then it upweights points that are like more nearby the original image, so have less of the image removed, and downweights ones farther away because these are less important. Now it outputs something that looks like this. Um, and basically what this says is that these green areas in the image are more positively influencing these, this Blenheim Spaniel class, and these red areas are sort of negatively influencing it. And how I would interpret this explanation is like, okay, the model seems to be looking at the dog's face for the most part. Um, for this prediction. Um, there are several advantages and disadvantages of these techniques. Um, for one, uh, they only really need a black box access, which makes them um, pretty ready to use in a bunch of different situations. Um, they're quite easy to implement. Uh, they're highly flexible and we can like customize things about how you do perturbations, how you define locality, um, and sort of how wide or small you make um, the local area this explanation is fit on uh, in order to um, best explain predictions for you, your use case. They kind of provide, and they do provide a, uh, a rough understanding of what's going on for model predictions. Now, uh, as sort of a key disadvantage here, and one thing we're gonna talk about um, a bit, is that these methods are pretty highly sensitive to how they go about sampling perturbations. So you, if you imagine like we sample a set of perturbations like these black dots once, um, if we do it again, we could get like a totally different set of perturbations. And actually this can have like pretty significant um, effects on the explanation we end up fitting. And, kinda, and as a result, um, explanations can be a bit unstable. Um, it's quite tricky to set hyperparameters for the explanations um, because it's difficult to say like whether you want to fit it really tightly or really loosely. Um, and even though there's there's some flexibility there, it's often hard for people to, to say like, oh, this is the right, the right way to do it. 
Um, and it's kind of, and it's really hard to say like uh, when you have like a good explanation, because like maybe if you sample more, your explanation will change. Um, and kind of counterintuitively, um, a lot of the time it can be unclear when to, to trust an uh, one of these model agnostic local explanations, which is not really what we would want for um, something that's supposed to explain a prediction. Um, so kind of um, at the beginning of my PhD, we were, we were interested in uh, taking these, these shortcomings to the limit. Um, so we've ordered, we were interested in this question of like, in the worst case, um, what can go wrong with uh, model agnostic local post hoc explanations? Um, and we, we took on this question, this work, and in particular, we took on the task of, can you design a model whose explanations are sort of totally unfaithful to the model, what the model is doing? So can you have explanations that do one thing and, uh, or can you have a model that does one thing and the explanations explain something completely different? And it turns out you can, and I'll, I'll tell you how, um, but that's the, that's the overall guiding question with this work. So to illustrate why this question might be important, uh, we imagine the situation where we wanted to use uh, tools like Lime, also a similar one called SHAP, uh, to audit a model. In particular, uh, there's, there's um, potentially some bad actor out there who's making discriminatory decisions on data we want to use um, tools like postdoc explanations to figure out if this model is behaving fairly or not. Um, and to do that, basically, we're going to run postdoc explanations and we're going to see if um, sensitive features, things like race or gender, are um, indicated as being important by the postdoc explanations. So again, on, on one hand, we have this bad actor here. They're trying to do something discriminatory but we're gonna try and use postdoc explanations to figure out if they are. And the bad actor, what they wanna do is they wanna say like, they wanna design their model in such a way that they can go about doing the discriminatory decisions. So building models that rely on things like race and gender, but um, will fool us as the auditor. So when we look at the postdoc explanations, it will indicate uh, some other set of features uh, is important or some reasonable set of features, things like credit score or income, for instance. So it is possible to design classifiers in this way and let's, let's see how. So kind of the intuition for why you can do this is that uh, let's, let's go back, let's go back and, and look at how a technique like Lyme samples perturbations. So let's look at, uh, an original image, so something like, like this that you would feed into your model and want to get a prediction on. And then let's compare this to the, the perturbation set. So if I look at these, these perturbed images from Lime, um, I'm going to see that there's these like big black blotches masked off in the image. And kind of the thing to recognize here is that these images would, would never appear naturally, right? Um, you would, you know, never, or, you know, very, very rarely see an image of a dog that naturally has, you know, one of these big black splotches in it. Um, so the key, the, the thing to recognize here is that uh, the original data distribution, so this distribution of images, is pretty different from the distribution of sample perturbations. And consequently, um, it's straightforward to train a classifier that does one thing on the original images, but something else on the perturbations. So. In the context of our um, detecting discrimination example, a bad actor could train a model that does uh, uh, some discriminatory behavior on the original input distribution, but uh, does something completely on the perturbation distribution. So uh, the model could behave fairly on the perturbation distribution and unfairly on the original data distribution. And Lime would only explain um, what's going on on the perturbation distribution. And thus, uh, the adversary will be successful. So let's look at some results here. Um, running this setup on the Compass Recidivism Prediction data set. Um, so the goal here is to predict whether someone is uh, likely to uh, recommit a crime. And uh, the way we evaluate this is uh, the percent of the time that a given feature appears as the first, second, or third most important feature. So uh, uh, here we see uh, the model that before the attack, 
Um, so here the race feature appears. It's the first most important feature on all of the test instances. And we can see that without running the attack, um, a line indicates to us that the model is behaving unfairly. And to be clear, this model is basically just um, an, an if statement on the race feature. So it's, it's totally discriminatory. Um, but when you run the attack, um, we see that uh, the race feature is um, relegated to sort of um, appearing randomly in the next few features. Well, uh, we introduce uh, an uncorrelated feature, which through the attack we make appear as the first most important feature all the time. And kind of one thing to point out here is that these two, um, these two models have the same exact predictions or very, very close to the same exact predictions on the, the testing data. Um, so these models are, both these models are still discriminatory, um, but the only thing that's changed is the, uh, um, uh, explanations. And uh, I'll also point out that the reason we use these uncorrelated features is because uh, we want to remove any effects that could be going on with um, like proxy variable importance, where the model um, or the explanations are still like relying on uh, something like race, but just explaining it through a proxy feature. So we, we just we introduce these uncorrelated features to remove any of these issues. And we, you can also keep doing this. So you can introduce more features um, and the model will, uh, the explanations will still say those are um, important. So you can, so you can sort of keep doing this and designing explanations to however you want them to appear. So you can take away from this that the attack is pretty successful. Um, this isn't where the story ends. Um, so- yeah, Can I ask a question? Please? Yeah, yeah. Um, so you mentioned that this is a very simple model. It's basically um, an if statement over the phrase feature. Yes. Right. Uh, so when you say you introduced uncorrelated feature one and two, how do you introduce this feature in the model? I mean, model is looking for the race feature only. So the model is only looking for the race feature, um, but we introduced this 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 randomly drawn like zero one feature, um, and we want to like make the model. Uh, we want to make the explanations like explain this feature that has nothing to do with the predictions as the most important, while the model on the um, actual data is only relying on the race feature. Uh, so basically, this uncorrelated feature one is supplied to the model, like yeah. in, in the guise of a race feature. Oh, it's it's a it's a feature we introduced to the data. Um, mm -hmm. So it's just a, a, a randomly drawn column we we just put into the data. And then we want to make this feature the most important feature with the attack. Um, I so it's, that, that I understand, but the way uh, I mean, your model is working only on the race feature, yes. right? So would it look at how would it look at that extra column that you added? So uh, it, it basically wouldn't look at it. It basically okay. okay. It would not look at it. Okay, it's only the explanation that's making it look very important. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Cool. Uh, just a clarify, like just a follow up question on Amara's question. So during training of this model, you have the race feature as well as this uncorrelated feature that you've given, but yeah. the model is trained to use only the race feature, right? So yes. Or... Um, we actually, yeah. Um, I, I said this. This model is basically just an if statement. Um, I should have been more specific. It is just an if statement. So there isn't oh, really okay. a training phase. <laughs> oh, I see. I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's it's it is just an if statement on the race feature. Um, so we like this is like what we imagine to be like a, a very discriminatory model. Got it. Okay. Um, and, and another quick question. So um, when you talk about perturbations in Lime, um, how do the perturbations look like if you have such um, discrete tabular kind of data? Like, yeah. What, what so, oh yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So for tabular data, what Lime does, or for ca oh yeah, just like oh, the categorical, categorical features. So Mm -hmm. um, so if there's like feature A, B, and C, and A appears in 70% of the training instances, B appears 20%, C appears 10%, um, what line would do with, for perturbations um, over like uh, N perturbations, it would make sure that the, that distribution of the um, categorical feature like would appear in those perturbations at the same rate. So it would draw like, yeah, like 70% of the time, the perturbations would be feature A, 20 and 10%. I see, I so, see. Yeah. 
Gotcha. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Cool. Um, any other questions here? Cool. Um, cool. I'll keep going here. So uh, yeah, this this isn't quite where the story ends. Uh, we also looked at um, other sorts of explanations and how these methods can be attacked. Um, and we also we looked at this other type called uh, counterfactual explanations. Um, and these techniques uh, deal with this um, very uh, um, very useful question, where if you have someone who says something like, I want a loan, and, uh, their information is passed to a classifier. The classifier says, you don't get a loan. Um, counterfactual explanations would say, what do you need to do to, to get the loan? So maybe they would spit out something like, you need to make a thousand more bucks a year in order to, in order to get the loan. And basically how these methods work is that uh, if you had some like granted loan, denied loan decision surface um, and some original data point X, uh, these methods would follow along the gradient of counterfactual objective G um, to find a counterfactual C um, that is in the desired class. So it does receive the loan, um, but also minimize the difficulty of that person achieving uh, achieving the loan. And uh, we imagine uh, a similar situation to these be methods being manipulated, um, where we have uh, two sensitive, uh, sensitive group in the data, so maybe men and women. Um, their information is passed to the classifier. Um, and this is another like uh, bad actor situation where a bad actor controls this classifier. And the counterfactual explanation spit out something like, you need to make a thousand more bucks a year uh, for both of these people. And us as the auditor would say like, okay, this, this looks fair um, for both these people. It seems roughly like uh, make a thousand more bucks a year. Um, so that's, that's pretty even between both these people. Um, but the bad actor can design the model in such a way that uh, when they add just a negligible perturbation um, to a certain group in the data, so here, men, for instance, all of a sudden, the counterfactuals are much easier to achieve to this group. <clears throat> so simply by uh, like perturbing um, individuals from a, a certain group by um, infinitesimal amount of noise, um, they can get very, very easy to achieve, uh, very easy to achieve counterfactuals. Um, so this is sort of a, a backdoor into the model. Um, where for one group, if you just add a little bit, a little bit of noise, you get very easy counterfactuals. Um, so why does something like this work? Um, the key idea is that because these methods use gradient descent or black box gradient descent, um, they can suffer from issues of converging to different local minimums. So if you imagine you start the counterfactual search <clears throat> at some point X, And you follow along the gradient of the counterfactual objective. Um, here, this would starting at this point x, it would take you all the way down here to a of x. Um, you would end up very far away. But if you started just from a slight perturbation away, you could end up much closer. Oops. You could end up at x plus delta. And then if you ran the, the search, you would end up a of x plus delta, which is actually closer to the original point x. So that's. Um, where these, these attacks sort of start to work and uh, we'll rely on them. So uh, I'm not gonna dive into too much further in the results here, um, but encourage you to check out this paper um, if you're interested in seeing this a bit more. Um, so this is about halfway through. So I wanted to uh, take a, a brief break from questions. I know, I know people asked a few questions, but if anyone has anything else, happy to answer some. Um, I have a very quick, very quick question. Um, so what you just showed was that using the perturbations, you're not changing the final model classifications. It's only the explanations, correct? Yes. Yeah. So okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the the intuition is like there's this backdoor, and yeah, want to add the perturbation, and it ultimately ends up getting predicted alone, but 
the way shown to a certain group is much, much easier. Okay. So, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I had a more general question as well, like more a high level one. Yeah. So, um, I guess, um, like what, what, what is reliability in, in the case of explanations? So, um, you, you, do we want, like, are you saying that it needs to be fair across all um, variables or is it the case that it needs to expose bias that is maybe present in the model? Yeah. So, yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of, a lot to unpack there. Um, like ideally, uh, yeah, I think ideally uh, the explanation, like the post hoc explanation would tell us like which set of features are actually most important for the model's prediction, right? Like it should not do this thing where um, the model relies on some totally different set of features on the true data or like the, the data distribution you train the model on versus the one being explained. Like this is defi a definite source of unreliability. Um, we're also going to look at some unreliability notions associated with like perturbations, like fitting these explanations um, beyond this, this adversarial case. Um, so th there's a couple, couple different ways. Um, there's also reliability associated with like ease of use, I think, like how easy it is for practitioners to actually like implement these methods for their scenarios. Like do they quickly run into things that lead them to like down bad rabbit holes and fitting these methods wrong. Um, so there's probably, there's probably like three or four different ways to think about reliability here. Yeah, it sure is a pretty challenging, like it's, it's a very nuanced concept, I guess. So, um, yeah. Um, and one particular example that I, I kind of wanted to ask is in, in the first, um, like the bird versus the dog classifier that you showed. So let's say your explanations indicate that um, the dog's face is what um, the model is actually using, but it's ending up with the wrong classification. So it still predicts bird, but somehow the, it, the, the, mm. the model is looking at the, the dog's face. So um, is, is that an indication that your model has not trained well, or could you basically use explanations to point to, okay, how can we improve the model's performance? And um, is that something that post hoc explanations can do? Like, not just as a, like, can you use post hoc explanations to improve the model's predictions as, as well? Yeah, you, you you definitely could. Um, I think you're hinting at like one of the so one of the very like classic motivating examples for this work is like this this um, husky wolf example, where the model is learning to classify huskies based on the snow in the background of the image, which is uh, I think like kind of similar to what you're saying. So you definitely can use these methods to see like oh is it looking at the snow to give the prediction or like if it's looking at the dog's face to predict like giraffe this is also bad right. Um, the dip, the, the thing to, uh, the sort of the nuance here is that, uh, postdoc explanations are built for, uh, a specific class. So let's say that like my model was predicting giraffe. Um, but if I ran the postdoc explanation on the Blenheim Spaniel class, it might still tell me that dog's face is the most important for that mm -hmm. prediction, for that class prediction. And that might be okay. But the issue would emerge is if you looked at the draft class and then it was also saying like, um, I, I, I don't know, like the dog's face was important for that. Like maybe like into even if it was getting the prediction wrong, like the model would hopefully be looking at like the tundra in the background. Like if it's African tundra, it might be more likely to be a draft. Um, so there's there's another another sort of thing to consider there. And I guess, um... I don't want to take up too much of your time on this discussion, but um, just a high level question on when do we think that, okay, an explanation is good enough or not? Like, is that a metric that you mm -hmm. use or is it just qualitative um, analysis that domain knowledge, um, like domain experts have to basically? Uh... Yeah, uh, it's, it, it's a hard question. Like there's uh, quite a few different ways, like people are thinking about how do you model a good explanation? Um, I feel like personally, I've sort of almost started using these techniques as a bit like exploratory methods, um, where they're just like one thing in my toolkit to try and figure out like what a model is doing. 
Um, I think one way to like, that's pretty reasonable to evaluate these techniques is if you do something just like, um, uh, like rank the feature importances, um, remove like the most important feature to the nth most important feature, and just look at the curve and the change in the model's prediction. So like, if you sort of, if you found the first best feature, like it should change the model's prediction the most. And you can do things like compute like AUC metrics on that um, and sort of so on and so forth. And you can do it the other way, like where you add in the least impo most important features and it shouldn't change the model so much. So these ranking based metrics um, seem pretty reasonable. Um, but the other complication here is like techniques sort of think about definitions of like explanations differently. So like between something like Lyme and Shap, they rely on uh, two different sets of like assumptions so like sometimes when comparing works that evaluate like Lyme versus Shop, they choose like evaluation strategies that are more favorable to Lyme's assumptions versus Shop's assumptions. So yeah, <laughs> I, I mean like ultimately you need to think about like your intended use case and um, like what you're trying to achieve with your explanations. And there's no one size fits all answer in my opinion, but uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Cool, anything else here? Cool. Well, um, I might just keep going on then um, to inspect a bit of our work on what we're doing to ultimately build more reliable explanations. Um, and I'll sort of preface this section like this: this isn't as concerned with what we're with like solving the attacks. Um, sort of for context, after we published that paper, there was like seven different papers that immediately offered solutions. So we kind of like okay, it seems like pretty reasonable that these like might not be an issue in practice. So what are the other issues with explanations that we could address? Um, so in particular, we were looking at some of these issues related to um, how people fit explanations. So what are the what are the issues with studying hyperparameters in these methods? And in particular, like what are the issues with uh, um, selecting like uh, perturbations um, for fitting explanations? So to kind of like motivate uh, uh, where people run into issues with these techniques. Um, let's look at um, a single explanation or uh, two explanations for a single instance on the compass for recidivism prediction data set, um, just with different hyperparameters by varying this perturbations hyperparameter. So these are, and I just pulled out uh, the two most important features here. There's more features in this data set. So between these two explanations, um, between these two different explanations, I kind of see something interesting. I see that uh, on the left-hand side one, it says misdemeanor charge is the most important, but on the right-hand side one, it says female is the most important. Um, so this uh, is a bit confusing. You would imagine if you're like an end user of these techniques and you got both of these, um, they don't really offer a lot of context. So you would be like, what's going on here? Like is female or misdemeanor charge actually the most important? Um, so the kind of like the, the tax we take in this work is to say, uh, instead of just giving um, a point estimate feature importances, can we include notions of uncertainty with these feature importances? And can we use this to provide a bit more context associated with the explanations? So like immediately, if we use our technique um, and compare these two, uh, these two explanations, um, all of a sudden we see something a bit more useful. We see that, uh, okay, there's a lot of uncertainty associated with the one on the left-hand side. Maybe I shouldn't trust this explanation quite as much. And there is um, a lot less uncertainty associated with the explanation on the right-hand side. This one's probably a bit better. We can also take this to uh, uh, other domains. So remembering this goal of being model agnostic, we could take it to vision domains, um, where this is what Lyme would provide for the, the Blenheim Spaniel image. Um, and it would say that, uh, okay, this, this red area looks like it's negatively contributing to prediction, but if we compare this to our technique, which we refer to as Bayes Lyme, it would tell us that, uh, oh, maybe there is some uncertainty associated with this, this part of the image contributing negatively. Um, so we might need to sample more, do a bit more analysis here to figure out if that's actually the case. So um, to realize explanations that include uncertainty estimates, 
uh, we uh, introduced this, uh, this technique to that that allows incorporating um, a number of different types of explanations into uh, Bayesian linear regression. So basically, we're going to take some uh, feature importances and some perturbation z, like such. We're going to model some um, error into this linear regression, and we're base and, and we're basically just going to weight this error by the by a weighting function, which could be like the lime kernel or the shop kernel, um, and use this to upweight or downweight points. And we're also going to fix priors on our feature importances and the the variance of our error. Um, and for some more context, we, we basically leave these um, the hyperparameters that these priors set to be um, uninformative. And using this in closed form, we can recover uh, um, uh, a local explanation that also includes some notions of uncertainty with it. Um, so uh, there's a couple of different notions of uncertainty here. Um, so one is the future importance uncertainty that we've looked at. Um, and this is the uncertainty associated with those feature importance estimates. Um, and it will go to zero with sort of uh, enough perturbations or if you sample, keep sampling, because at some point we'll find the best feature importances. Um, but we can also look at the error uncertainty, the explanation, um, and this will, uh, this will sort of remain high for models that are um, less locally linear. Um, so the first thing we evaluated with this technique is like how well calibrated are these notions of uncertainty. So with the with the credible intervals that our method reveals, um, we want to be able to say the converged feature importance. So the feature importance that occurs if we run the explanation with an infinite number of perturbations is within the ninety five percent credible interval. Um, at, you know, a much lower sample amount. You know, ninety five percent of the time. So is this claim correct in practice? Um, and the, the two um, explanation variants within our framework we considered were uh, a variant of Lyme and a variant of SHAP. Um, so this is just substituting the kernel SHAP kernel and Lyme kernel into that weighting function. Um, oh, and one other thing I forgot about this is uh, um, our technique will, will output the same like uh, mean feature importances as both Lyme and SHAP. So the Lyme and SHAP kernel SHAP explanations are the same at the mean as base Lyme and base SHAP. And this technique just says, it just gives you a notion of uncertainty with those, with those feature importances. So we evaluated across um, uh, like some image data sets and some uh, structured data sets. Um, and uh, closer to 95, uh, 95 is better here. And we see that it's like pretty well calibrated for Lime, um, which is promising. It's a little bit less so for SHAP, kind of due to how um, or how uh, unstable the kernel can be at times, um, but it still reveals some pretty reasonable results, um, which is nice. Um, we were also interested in um, understanding how you could use uncertainty to estimate other key hyperparameters. And so in particular, the number of perturbations you need to sample an explanation. So normally when you go about like fitting these explanations, you have to provide this perturbations number and this is actually like a bit like confusing number in my opinion to use because uh, it kind of varies how many perturbations you need for the explanation. Um, and there's no like nice way to connect like that number to the actual like quality of the explanation basically. So the way we thought about it in this work is like, okay, what if um, someone could just input like a confidence level for the explanation? So what if they could say like, I want the width of like the 95% credible interval to be 0 0.01 for these feature importances, indicating that they're like pretty tight um, around the future. Um, so a user could come along and provide this like much more intuitive technique with our method. And this estimate, which we would call perturbations to go, would tell you like an integer valued number of perturbations you need to get the explanation. And like the intuition for this method is um, from just a few sampled perturbations, PTG says uh, how many more you need. So if the local linear, the local decision surface is very locally linear, it would say like, oh, you probably don't need to sample so much more, but if it's very nonlinear. It would say like, you need to sample a lot more because um, there's some confusing stuff going on here. Um, and the, the formula for this method is, is pretty straightforward. It relates uh, the local error of the explanation. 
So uh, if it's like nonlinear versus very locally linear on that initial set of perturbations, error will be like higher versus lower causing, so if it's high, let's say you need to sample more perturbations. And then it also relates the, the perturbation proximity based on the kernel function of the explanation. So like how close are the, the perturbations you've seen so far um, and the desired uncertainty level. So if you want a more confident explanation, you're also going to need to to sample more. Um, so it provides us like um, kind of straightforward way to estimate how many perturbations you need. That's also flexible to the, the kernel function you use. Um, so that's um, kind of a nice different way to think about um, setting this perturbations number for explanations. Um, I have a quick question. Could yeah. you remind us how the local error is computed again? Like how do you... Um... Yeah, uh, it's basically just the MSE of this um, oh, I see. local regression. So it's like a goodness of fit of yeah. Uh, got it. Okay. Yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so if like uh, yeah, so if the the local explanation is very accurate on points that are close by the original instance, and the model is locally linear, that's going to be very low, and it's going to say like the number of perturbations you need to get a confident explanation are not not that much more. Basically. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, cool. Uh, we also used the predictive um, uncertainty of uh, this Bayesian regression to say to do a variant of uncertainty sampling, which we call focus sampling. Um, and kind of intuitively, all this does is it says, given a batch of potential perturbations to sample. We just select for uh, those that have um, higher uncertainty, um, basically. And this allows us to do things or like uh, generate explanations more quickly. Um, one other way to see this is like with our dog and bird example, if we have a batch of points like this, focus sampling would say, oh, you need to sample over here because those are the most informative. Um, so we found this technique led to quicker convergence overall, um, which was nice, um, particularly for models that are more query inefficient. Um, so for large image models or large language models, um, this could potentially speed up explanations. Um, a little bit less so for like really small model models like uh, like small boosted trees and things like this. It might not help so much. We also found it could help improve like the stability of the explanation. So if you fit an explanation and just perturb the original instance you're explaining slightly, the explanations were a bit more stable, which is another desirable characteristic of explanations. Um, so uh, um, sort of in conclusion, uh, we need techniques to figure out how to trust ML models. We've looked at a few ways post hoc explanations might not be achieving this goal, um, some shortcomings. And then we also looked at some methods uh, people were using uncertainty to help us overcome some of these challenges. Um, so uh, yeah, that's all for my talk. Um, thought I had one more slide here, but I guess not. All right, thank you. Awesome, this was great. Um, so thank you so much, Dylan. Uh, before we actually jump into the questions and discussion, maybe we can all give a round of uh, virtual applause to Dylan for the talk. And um, are there questions for Dylan that um, we can talk about, or I can get started with them? Oh, um, one other thing I wanted to end on. Uh, this is my slide. So one thing we're working on now um, is we're working on uh, dialogue systems for explanations. So like model interaction directly through dialogue and sort of offloads the burden of people figuring out uh, like what explanations to use strictly through dialogue. So anyways, that was that was what I wanted to end on. <laughs> but, um, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. So and yes, that's it. Happy to take any questions. Awesome. Um, maybe I can get started with questions. Um, so um, I was curious, um, especially with the um, like I thought the, the work that you did on determining how many perturbations you need to um, actually get a reliable explanation was very cool. 
um, do you have a sense of like how these large, let's say image models, um, how many perturbations did actually um, these models require on a, a data set like ImageNet? What, what's yeah, the yeah. To get? Yeah, there's, there's quite a few variable factors. Um, so if you, if you look at uh, like how you go about sampling perturbations, like mm -hmm. Lime uses these, these uh, like image segments basically. Um, and if you make these really small, um, it becomes harder. And if you make them like less small, it becomes easier. Um, so, but, but like for, uh, for, for like images of this size that are not that ambiguous, like it might be like a couple thousand, but if the image is like much more ambiguous, it can easily extend into 10,000 for a staple explanation. So it is pretty, it is pretty query intensive. And that was I one see. of the motivating factors behind the focus sampling part. Got it. And do you also experiment with different kinds of perturbations or do you use the ones that Lime um, uses on these? Yeah, uh, let's see. So the main choice is the, the choice of the segmentation function. Mm -hmm. um, I, I actually forget that off the top of my head whether the, the segmentation method was um, the same as Lime. Um, yeah, I, I kind of forget if you use the same one or not. <laughs> but uh, th this also um, can have an effect if run experiments at some point. Um, since like some of the segmentations like this one like are so much more um, like refined basically like around the dog's face, but others are like much blockier. Like, uh, let's see, like here. Like these ones are just basically like squares. Mm. Um, so this can have, this can actually have a, a pretty big effect as well. Um, so yeah, so unfortunately there are a lot of, yeah, a lot of variables here with fitting these explanations, you're right. Um, which is kind of, yeah, it goes back to their difficulty. Um, uh, people have like kind of trying to like, for, for explaining image models and, um, you know, uh, language models, uh, people have definitely, I think more so relied on gradient-based techniques that don't take this like segmentation function um, because to help sort of overcome some of these, these choices. Um, but yeah. I see. Awesome, thank you. Um, are there any other questions for the room? Uh, yes. Uh, so in my case, um, so there was this paper previously that had discussed that the ability to predict, let's say an image class, like let's say frog, depended more on the, let's say like the high frequency signal of the image. Like you could remove a lot of the detail in the image and it would still be able to predict the frog. So in the perturbations that you study, is there anything that kind of relates that information? Like let's say the high frequency or the edges of the image, that type of stuff? Or? Um, hmm. Yeah, I guess like for this technique, yeah, I'm not, I'm not so familiar with which work you're referring to here. Uh, high frequency. Yeah, I, I, I guess like if, if these, like whatever spurious patterns that are going on in the image, like high frequency, if, if they appear like um, on the like upper left hand, after upper left hand corner, I, I guess presumably if you didn't have it and you just black them out, it would change the prediction a lot. So it, it should be able to detect something like that, but I, I would think, um, but uh, yeah, I guess I wouldn't, I wouldn't know for certain. Um, as long as it's some pattern that like would change when you masked it out or modified it somehow, then this technique would say like, that's important. Okay. Yeah. Um, is that the like adversarial examples are bugs or features not bugs? Is that the paper you're referring to? Is that something? I believe so. Um, if <laughs> someone had discussed it at a other literature club so i'm trying to look up the paper yeah but that's kind of what i remember at the high level yeah interesting um i have a question it's like more general um yeah. out of curiosity have you found any 
difference between like, the uh, the uncertainty between different uh, input modalities? Like, is imaging explanation more uncertain, or it's like text or tabular yeah. data explanation more uncertain? Yeah, images are definitely more uncertain. Um, the uncertainty tends to be due to like the higher order interaction between the features. Mm -hmm. So like, and I think on a lot of structured data sets, there is just a bit less higher order interaction. Right. Um, so uh, yeah, definitely it's, it's harder for images and much, much harder for um, language models. Mm -hmm. That's um, yeah. I had a question also related to the perturbations again. Yeah. Um, there is, I think, this um, recent work that kind of said that if you black out certain parts of the images, then the model basically uses the blacked out regions to actually make its predictions. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering that, so especially in, in the last, uh, I think one of your slides where you visualize the different perturbations on the Spaniel example. So, um, if you could go to that slide, um, I think it was this one. Yeah. Yeah. So the third, um, the third figure from the left. So essentially, having a black year, it might just assume that it, you know it's a regular spaniel versus. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering, um, are there things that we can do to improve this this perturbation instead of just blacking out regions? Um, could we try to interpolate it in some other way or add noise? Or have you encountered anything that um, suggests that yeah. like just blacking out regions might lead to primitive explanations? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely an issue because this attack is basically saying that like the perturbations are OOD and the model could be doing whatever on these. And, um, <laughs> yeah, so this is like another way to look at this issue, right? Like I, I totally see what, what, um, what point you're bringing up here though. Um, the solutions, like at least people have proposed for this, are using some smarter ways to um, generate the perturbations. Mm -hmm. um, so can you at least use um, some patch set that is closer to the actual data distribution? Um, techniques like Lime and Shop, when you apply them for tabular data, um, you can do things like try and uh, draw them from distributions that are a bit closer to the data distribution. And these, mm -hmm. these, these help things out. Um, but yeah, you're right that like choosing black or gray um, could potentially lead to like a lot of different results. And yeah, the baseline, the baseline here is a, like people refer to it as like the baseline you use for competing the explanation. And this is just, yeah, another issue as well. Um, uh, can lead to pretty variable, variable results. Um, yeah, there's there's you know, quite a few papers on that pointing that out now. I think, um, yeah, for this work, we we only considered blacking them out, um, yeah, because we were kind of interested in this question of like creating more stable explanations. So I don't think we concentrated it on it quite as much. I see. Yeah. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um. I see that we are running slightly over time, but are there any other questions, like last minute questions that people want to ask? Okay, then if not, let's thank Dylan again. Um, thanks so much, Dylan. And we'll put the video recording on YouTube later today and send you a link as well. And if oh, people have yeah. further questions or follow up, um, feel free to reach out to Dylan or you can also um, reach out to us and we'll be happy to put you in touch with him. Um, yeah, see you all next Thursday and have a good uh, week. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Nice to meet you guys. Bye.